Well, it's a great morning in this place, and it's good for us to hear great things that are happening with our young people in this church. Got the good reports from many women this morning on Chosen Women that's happened this weekend. And uh, if we had time, we'd have a report. But, of course, next weekend is Promise Keepers. They're really coming to town, and so I'm sure many of you will want to get involved in doing that. As I read Colossians 3 this week, and I hope you read it too, I realized how, what a tremendous impact this section of Scripture makes on our lives as believers. And so we're back in Colossians 3. You're to read that chapter every day this week. And I just kind of want to talk to you about Christ as the focus of our life. You see, everybody's out making speeches right now. Graduation, baccalaureate, lots of speeches, some good, some bad, some long, some short. Tuesday night, I had the privilege to go and pray at baccalaureate at St. Anthony's for the Bullard High crowd. My neighbor, Dr. Tom Granada, spoke, did an excellent job, talked about the four pillars that need to stand on a solid rock of faith, the pillar of integrity and perseverance and forgiveness and passion. Really, it was a wonderful, wonderful service. I checked with uh, Milo Martin about how Bill Cosby did when he spoke at graduation at USC. He said, basically, Bill Cosby said, okay, kids, it's time to get real. It's time to get honest. It's time to stop conning your parents. It's time to get a job. That's great advice for a crowd that's coming out of college. They've been kind of floating along and everything's been so good. And all at once that if parents have any sense, they'll chop off all that subsidy and say, okay, go to work. You've gotten that degree. Of course, the most famous graduation speech ever is the one that was made by Winston Churchill. You know, he had that bulldog look anyhow, and he stood up and he looked at a crowd as he'd been introduced, and he said, never give up. Never, never give up. And he sat down. That was the end of the speech. Only had one point, but you know, you couldn't go out of there confused, and I wonder what he meant. Now, it's important for us, you come to a graduation time, we're spilling a whole bunch of kids out onto the landscape of our country. It's important for us to take a look at what this country looks like right now. I want to read two things to you that really make us aware more than we want to be of the conditions in this country. This letter from Jim Dobson that many of you, I'm sure, got in your homes, where he goes back to September of 95, November of 96, where that uh, teenage girl delivered a child in a Delaware motel and then she and her boyfriend allegedly beat the child to death and put it in a plastic bag and dropped it in the dumpster. The New Jer Jersey teenager in 97 who gave birth to a baby in a bathroom stall at her high school prom dropped the baby in the trash, returned to the dance floor, and then asked the band to play her favorite song, The Unforgiven. October of 97, the 16-year-old kid in Mississippi who shot and killed two including his former girlfriend having already killed his mother. December of 97, a young boy opened fire on a prayer meeting in a high school in Paducah, Kentucky, killing three and wounding five. December of 97, 14-year-old boy in Stamps, Arkansas, fired sniper rounds outside his school, wounding two students. In March of 98, Dallas, Texas, four teenagers claiming to be vampires, went on a drug-crazed destruction spree, vandalizing dozens of cars and homes, spray-painting racial slurs and burning down the office and fellowship hall of Bethany Lutheran Church. April of 98, Yonkers, New York, 15-year-old girl upset that her teacher called her parents about her poor academic performance, attacked the pregnant instructor with a hammer. The teacher suffered multiple skull fractures. April of 98, Indianapolis, Indiana, police have begun random searches for weapons on school buses and in elementary schools after an eight-year-old boy allegedly pointed a gun at a female classmate who was teasing him about his ears. April of 98, four teenagers in Santa Cruz, California, arrested on charges of drugging an 11-year-old girl and raping her. And then they allegedly raped her in the parking lot, then drove 10 miles to a wooded area where they smoked heroin and raped her again for several hours. May of 98, Springfield, Oregon, 
This kid fired 51 rounds, two dead, 18 wounded, plus the fact that he had already killed his parents. When you think about that, Dobson says this, where did we go wrong? At least some of the answers can be found in the radical notions that have emerged in the last 30 years. Judges, with the acquiescence of our legislators, have made it illegal for our schools to post the Ten Commandments. It is becoming increasingly difficult and dangerous for students to pray together on school campuses. Meanwhile, it's easier for a man or woman to obtain a divorce than to escape from an automobile lease agreement. The President of the United States embraces the radical homosexual movement which opposes the legal basis of marriage as a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. States are prohibited from protecting innocent children in the process of being born from those who would puncture their skulls and suck out their brains. Those who oppose this infanticide are called extremists by our political leaders. Federal authorities decline to prosecute hardcore pornographers. The government spends billions to promote safe sex ideology in our schools, and officials hand out condoms and pills to kids who assume they're expected to use them. Laws protecting children from indecent material on the Internet are struck down by justices to protect the right of adults to market pornography. Video poker machines dot the landscape of a nation that was built on principles of thrift and deferred gratification. The entertainment industry glorifies violence and sexual exploitation, while pop music pays tribute to the killing of police and the raping of women. And the list goes on. How much carnage must we witness at our feet before we will raise our eyes to heaven? The American people know we are in a crisis. Our leaders don't seem to comprehend what is happening. It's time we all pull together, Americans of every political party and religious faith, to recover a sense of what God wants us to do for our nation. And then tack that alongside Mike McManus's article yesterday in the Fresno Bee, where he mentions all these gun things that are happening, and he talks about what, what is the problem. He said there's a more sinister, insidious poison than guns, is affecting the minds of youth. Have you heard of the television show South Park? Probably not. But ask any 8 to 12 year old and you'll get an earful. It's a cartoon on the Comedy Central Cable Network featuring four 8 year olds in an elementary school who have foul mouths and a love of mayhem. It is hot, generating more ad income than any other cable show. In every episode, one of the characters, Kenny, is murdered. He is shot, run over, stabbed, and even decapitated. Each time, the other kids say, oh, my God, they've killed Kenny. But they say it nonchalantly. After one killing, another character says, everybody has somebody they want killed. This is supposed to be funny. Why is Kenny killed each week? Matt Stone and Trey Parker, who created the series, say, Trey and I created Kenny so we can kill him. Leave us alone. Each show is also sexually shocking. An elephant makes love to a pig, the title of one show. And this eight-year-old competing in a science project says, I want to produce a pot-bellied elephant. When the animals show no interest in sexual things, they ask an adult what to do, and the adult advises them, get them good and drunk. When that fails, the school chef croons, tonight is right for love. You know I want to touch you when the lights go out. Love, baby, love so sweet. I want your love. You're burning like a dog in heat. And that worked. The show's violence has had a proven devastation consequence. Anita Ferguson of the American Maryland Times Press reported last week that a 12-year-old in Ocean City, Maryland, who committed suicide, left a note telling his parents to watch South Park to learn why he killed himself. He mentioned Kenny, the silent third grader murdered in every episode. I read this last night at church, and uh, Mitch and his family were there, and, and Jordan, his eight-year-old, came up to me and he said, you know, Buf, uh, just me and one other kid in my grade do not watch South Park. See, I had looked in the, in the cable section to see if I could find it, see if it was here. I couldn't find it, but Jordan let me know it's here. And the kids at school are watching it. The 8, and 9, and 10, and 11, and 12-year-olds are watching it and constantly getting this thing put into their mind. And as I think about all of this, 
and think about the trouble we're in, I have to say, what do we do? What should we as believers do? What's our most effective means of getting things done? You heard part of it here on the platform as you listened to Adam's testimony that he was invited in by a friend, by that Hammond kid that got him in here. And that's the kind of thing that needs to happen. But we live in a time when people are watching our lives. And that's why Colossians 3 is so wonderfully important to us. I just want to take you through Colossians 3 as a reminder that these are our responsibilities before God. God, Holy Spirit, empowers us and makes us to do these things. It will allow Him to be in control. And so as we read along, just let me lay it out to you and pray that this week as you read it, you'll find yourself coming to a place of getting honest with God in areas that you need to deal with in your life. Since you have been raised to new life in Christ, I'm talking to believers this morning. If you're not a believer, then you can listen in. But I'm talking to believers. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. That is a responsibility that you have and I have set our sights on the realities of heaven. Our sights are so often focused on the realities of this earth and we ignore heaven. It would be interesting to know how many of you this morning thought about heaven before you ever got to church. For how many does that occupy any time in our minds as believers? We are commanded to set our sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Now, I don't want a church full of people that are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. Know that for sure. But you see, when you begin to understand thinking about heaven is important to you because it's the most important truth in the Scripture, people will spend eternity either in heaven or in hell. There is not a third place. There are not 47 places you can go. You go to heaven if you put your faith in Christ, and you go to hell if you don't put your faith in Christ. It's that simple. Chosen Women started Friday night with Ann Graham Lotz preaching on heaven and firing that crowd up with the realities of what heaven is all about. And I just say to you, as a believer, we are told to set our sights on heaven and let heaven fill our thoughts. Do not think about things only here on the earth. For you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when he shall appear... We shall also be with him. Come on. When Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. You see, believer, God has covered us past. We put our faith in Christ. Presently, we are hid with Christ in God. And future, he says, when Christ, who is your real life, when he is revealed, you will have a share in his glory. He is coming back. And you just listen to the news this morning. You think about what's happening in this world. You think about the thousands that are dead in Afghanistan. You think about Pakistan and India firing off those nuclear weapons. You think about people who are saying, we are standing on the edge of a nuclear war on this planet. And you just see everything coming unstrung that we've preached for years. And people say, just don't get so nervous. Don't get so upset. But look at the world. While at the same time that is happening, God is doing incredible things in this world. He's bringing kids like Adam to himself. I had a phone call this morning from Opa in Borneo. And I talked to Opa and Star and Jim and Nancy, each one. And they couldn't, they couldn't help but to tell me about a little village they went out to where there's a little church, a new church, only started a year ago. They got 30 believers out there. And one of, one of the believers in that church is a Dayak. That's one of the tribes. And there, that other crowd, the, uh, uh, I can't remember, it starts with an M. But they hate one another. A year ago, this guy cut the heart out of one of those enemies and ate the heart. And today that man is a born-again believer, having put his faith in Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel still works when people will go and carry it with gusto. We live in a society here where we must demonstrate the gospel by the way that we live. People are not primarily interested in coming to preaching services. 
They're interested in seeing a life that's real. And only after seeing a life that is real will they avail themselves of the opportunity to say, yes, I'm interested. And they may not want to come to church then, but they may be interested in studying the Bible. And that's why I continue to push you and push you. Find someone that needs Jesus and offer to take them through the Timothy program. The Bible is a very interesting book. It's a, it's a puzzle to people in this world. They've never studied. They've never read it. They don't know what's in there. But if you take them step by step through, you could be the part of bringing them to Jesus Christ. Maybe one on one before they ever come to this place to listen. But let's go on. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Believer, understand something. Your soul has been saved. You live with two natures. That old nature is still there. Yes, we are to reckon it to be dead, but it can be very much alive because sin and earthly things lurk within us. I love that word lurk. It, it, it's a real picture in my mind of what's happening when that is lurking within us, waiting to pounce, waiting to take us down have nothing to do with sexual sin, impurity, lust, and shameful desires. That's a pretty clear list in a, in a country that is full of immorality, in a country that, that, that flaunts all of the immorality, in a country that talks about what it is, just they're not married, it's no problem. Reading a, an article in Life magazine last night about a country doctor up in Maine, and he goes to deliver this baby and her fiancé, Who's the father and child? That's the way we live in this country now. It's okay. Marriage is kind of beside the point. And when we look at that situation and understand that this is running rampant through our country, then we as believers better get a grip on things and put to death these sinful, earthly things, sexual sin, impurity, lust, and shameful desires. Don't be greedy for the good things of this life for that is idolatry. That's an interesting word to put at the end of greed, isn't it? You see, control is the issue. Will the things we want serve our needs or will our needs serve those things? There are a lot of people where they've got both mother and dad working that the primary reason both have to work is because there's so much greed to get stuff and keep buying, keep those credit cards up the wazoo, and find themselves in a situation where they absolutely cannot breathe. They can't give to God. They can't give time, money, or energy to God because they've got to work to pay those knocking bills that they've run up. And when you preach about that, folks say, stay out of my life. Just leave me alone. Well, here's the word talking about greed. And when you, when you read what it says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5, a greedy person is really an idolater who worships the things of this world. That's out of the word. A greedy person. Look at yourself. Think about it. Is greed grabbing hold of you? Do you find yourself not really trusting the promises of God? Matthew 6.33 is the one that says, Seek first God and his righteousness. He will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. That's another way of saying fix your mind on heaven. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Think about the eternal destiny of the people that are around you. And if we begin to do that, we can begin to see ourselves taking proper steps so that everyday greed does not allow us to attack the character of God. See, basically greed says God can't meet my needs. I'm going to go and do that. I've got to get all this stuff. I've got to do what I can to see if I can surround myself with enough stuff so I can finally be happy rather than stay focused on the Lord and function in a manner that it says we are to do here. Now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious gut behavior, slander, and dirty language. He's writing to believers. Is there that kind of stuff here in the church at Colossae? Yes. Is there that kind of stuff in the church here at Northwest? Yes. And it's high time, people, we understood the world is looking for a real demonstration that what we profess is what we possess. Don't lie to each other. 
for you have stripped off your old evil nature and its wicked deeds. In its place, you've closed yourself with a brand new nature that is continually being renewed as you learn more and more about Christ. People, the key to this whole thing is studying the Word. The key to this whole thing is saying, I'll be involved in the Word of God. I'll take time daily to read. I'll take time to get involved with the salt group. I'll take time to get involved in Timothy. I'll take time to teach because I've been through Timothy. I will find someone that is hungry for the Word of God and I will teach it to them. This is the thing that makes it happen. We learn more and more about Christ who created this new nature for us. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us who are believers. It's the amazing thing. God has put this mystery out that he lives in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And if we will allow the Spirit of God to empower us, we will see wonderful, miraculous things happen in the changing lives of people as they come and confess Christ as their Savior. Now, since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, well, we don't like that word holy, do we? Huh? We'd rather skip on that one. Well, I'm really not very holy. Why not? Why not? That's what God has called us to be. Why do we so easily excuse ourselves? Well, I'm sorry, it's just the way I am. I'm, I'm impatient. I have a bad temper. I have a bad tongue. I have a bad attitude. And excuse ourselves. And so the world sees this person that shows up here on Sunday. Yeah, oh yes, I'm a part of Northwest Church. And they see that rotten egg person out there all week long. Miserable attitude. Miserable things happening in the life. And they wonder, what difference does it make? Might as well go down to the lodge hall. I mean, there's no difference in what's going on. Might as well go to some country club function. No difference in what's going on. There must be a difference in our demonstration of life since God chose us to be the holy people whom he loves. You must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. How do you do on that list? See, my prayer is you'll take Colossians 3 this week and plow through it and have the courage to say, I'm not letting this happen. I am not doing this. I'm not fixing my mind on heaven like I should. You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And the most important piece of clothing you must wear is love. Love is what binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are all called to live in peace and always be thankful. People, this grocery list of things that comes down the line here absolutely must affect us as believers if we expect to have any effect on the world out there, on those that are lost that we say we care about. That in the privacy of my home, we kind of do a, a blanket prayer for all our friends that are lost. Let me tell you something. Get some names on that list. Get some faces when you pray. Think about those individuals that are lost, that are doomed, that are damned, that are on their way to hell. And unless someone somehow gets in their way and presents Jesus Christ as the answer, they're going to go to hell and stay there forever. And we'll stand one day before God Almighty giving account for what we did with the gift of life and the responsibility we had to live as we ought to live and to share the good news by word of mouth. Always be thankful. Let the words of Christ, there it is again, let the words of Christ in all their richness live in your hearts and make you wise. Let them do that. How are they going to do that? If you will open the gate and allow the words of Christ to live in your hearts. That's only going to happen as you dig in the Word. It's only going to happen as you give yourself to knowing the Scriptures. Use His words to teach and counsel each other. Boy, it'd be interesting to know how many in this place spent any time this week teaching and counseling anyone else. Maybe not in a formal program like Timothy or a formal Bible study, but sitting across a cup of coffee from someone you sat and talked about the Word of God and the things of God 
and you were teaching and counseling another believer to help them find the strength they need to walk with God. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, all the while giving thanks through him to God the Father. You see, we're told very plainly, we're to be the salt and the light in this world. There's never been a time when we have been more needed in the plan and the program of God, and God wants to work through us in bringing others to Jesus Christ. But unless we are salt, unless we make a difference, unless we permeate this society, unless we are light that folks can see and say there's something about that individual life that is so different, I absolutely must find my way to the Savior. Unless we are those things, folks, we're just a crowd going down to a nice place on the corner that's beautifully landscaped and everything's going wonderfully well. My prayer to God is this week, you tackle Colossians 3, and you tackle it with a, with a piece of paper and a pencil alongside, and where it says, let, ask yourself, am I letting this happen? Am I focusing my mind on heaven? Am I dealing with the areas of sinful things that are lurking in my life? Am I dealing with sexual sin and impurity and lust and shameful desires? Am I dealing with the greed? You see, it's amazing that the Holy Spirit puts in this same package sexual sin, impurity, lust, and greed. We'd like to separate those because greed is kind of like white-collar crime. It's okay for believers to do that. Not true. Because as we live in that area of greed, we continually demonstrate we don't really trust God to take care of us. And I say to you folks, it's time for us to get serious if we're to impact this city and bring our friends to Jesus Christ. They, first of all, in this age, more than any that I've lived in. Forty years in the ministry makes a difference, folks. It's different today. They're looking for reality in the life of the individual. And when they see that reality, only then will they respond. Stand with me. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege to share this platform with the young people in our church. We thank you for the work that you're doing among young people because of our youth pastors and the kids that they've got on fire for God that are out there dealing with their friends and bringing them along and inviting them to come and meet the Savior. How I pray that we as an adult congregation would get under the burden, would find ourselves willing to get into Colossians 3 this week and clean up the areas where we are being disobedient and find ourselves saying, I will walk with God. I will put my life alongside that until I can absolutely be everything God wants me to be to his glory. I pray for that person that's here this morning does not know Jesus. I pray that they'll, they'll walk out of here today saying, maybe there's more to this whole matter of being a Christian than I ever thought of. Maybe they'll even pull a card and fill it out and let us come and help them find their way to the Savior. Guide us and bless us as we go. We'll give you thanks in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.